Howdy y'all, Joe Hills here, recording as I always do in Nashville, Tennessee. We are looking out across the land, and what do we see? We see a roller coaster that reaches toward the sky. It starts real low, it begins to rise, and then it has a few sudden drops. Now, here's what I'm thinking we should accomplish this episode, whether you like it or not. You know, I was originally thinking that as people kind of rolled down the hill there, Let's uh, actually get in a cart and just demonstrate this real quick. Real qu quicker than that. Legs breaking is a, a problem in real life. But luckily in Minecraft, we just uh, either die or we don't. One thing I was thinking was, when we do these big drops here, it'd be cool if we had like a quick turn, and then we are going down into some sort of cave or something down here. The problem is that in Minecraft, the way the carts work... The player has to manually rotate the camera on each of the corners. So the quicker the turn, unfortunately, the less terrifying this will be in some ways because people might miss the sudden descent into everything down here. So here's what I'm thinking we're going to do. What if we get rid of this turn? Like, you know, just kind of boop. Everybody keeps saying, Joe, what happens if somebody punches the scaffold? Apparently not enough, because this part's still here. We'll use it later. But if we want to have a descent into some sort of terrifying cave, well, this natural rise here actually provides an excellent place for us to achieve that goal. So why don't we go ahead and just start digging this out, clearing some trees, and seeing maybe those drops will be even more scary if all of a sudden you're looking at a big old ravine. Yeah. You can make a ravine in Minecraft, right? What do you need, a shovel? I got a shovel. I might also want to get a beacon. I got a beacon. Don't have it with me. Not not present physically. But why don't we get started on this uh, ravine element of the roller coaster? Time skip. As fun as it's been improving these uh, stone pillars here, I've started to think about what we should do with the segment of the coaster after that drop. And I want to show you what I've been working on here. Why don't we head up this way? As you can see, we've got this kind of general fall here. And I had thought about having that drop into a nice scary lava pool or something like that before coming back around. But I realized it might be more terrifying if we added some sort of ravine or something like that. I've got a block back there i got to have to move. So yeah, there's the ravine I started digging out. We need to hang some lava down it. Unfortunately, right now, I don't have this set up to actually take me in there. Woo! This would be a very slow roll into a big lava pit if somebody was unlucky. But if somebody was sufficiently lucky to continue on this track, though, they would see... Woo, there's the repeaters. Then we go down into the ravine here. And what I want to do is have the ravine swing up and around this way. I think that that's going to kind of pay off for us. We can have like a huge lava waterfall that it looks like you're about to swing into. And then, boom, you're off this way. Now, unfortunately, one problem with going diagonal for a bit is you can't go diagonal and then go straight up. Like, we have to go diagonal and then begin the slope, right? So going diagonal would kind of look like this a little bit. Whoops. It's not perfect, but you get the idea. So we can go ahead and lay those tracks. No, we can't. I don't have those tracks with me. Oh, wait, but we do have the scaffolds. So, yeah, core concept, you would see it kind of go... Wait, did I not put these on scaffolds here? Oh, I guess once I went underground, I left the scaffolds behind, which is an interesting way to do it. I didn't intend to do that, but I, I do actually kind of like having that transition there to where we're just running on the bare rock here. We do still indicate where the tracks will go with the... um the stone bricks rather than the smooth stone. And we'll want to, in order to have our waterfall of lava or our lava curtain kind of come down here safely, we're going to need to dig this out some. Might as well grab this iron while we're here. No sense letting it go to waste, hiding behind a waterfall and all. So there we go. Got some beautiful little opportunities for a little bit of lava-related curtain fun. So... I'm going to go ahead and keep digging out this ravine and see how far we can get this episode. Time skip! I've done some work on the track. We've got it going down into the ravine and coming back up there. Why don't we give a quick hop onto the cart there and see how this goes. And I've been thinking about a few things recently. Whoa! 
probably should face forward for this segment. You know, it seems like people love to hang out with people who have common interests with them. Like, I've heard, uh, you know, some people say, like, common interests are a shortcut to intimacy. Like, even if you don't have, like, a ton of experience being around somebody, the fact that you have a ton of time invested in a shared experience can make you kind of more copacetic in general. And I was thinking about this partially because I realized that sometimes people allow themselves to get into more compromising situations for their personal identity in fan communities than in other parts of the world. Even or especially people who in general might be wary about like over investing in particular um, like interpersonal relationships. So, you know, let's say that you're really into Firefly, right? And you're just like shaking your fist at the, do they call it the Federation? I forget. The, yeah, but you're really into Firefly and you're shaking your fist at the government and saying, you can't take the sky from me. And, you know, you're drawing fan art or you're sewing your Jane Cobb hats. And, like, you, you're just like, okay, well, I'm going to hang out with other people who sew Jane Cobb hats or, or do fan art. But realistically, the people that you hang out with in that community, like, whatever the first community you find in this um, kind of fan group might not necessarily be the best or only fan community for this art, you know? And I've noticed that people sometimes end up hanging out in these toxic fan communities because they're just like, well, you know, they get me and they get my art and, and that's really cool. But, like, there are so many different groups of people out there. Um, and every group has a different dynamic. And one thing I've seen is that Sometimes when the leaders of those communities tend to be kind of jerks, the whole community will see that as an excuse to be jerks. And, oh, there, there's this concept of like, well, you know, we're jerks to each other because we're such great friends. And it's like, are you or do you just all happen to like the same thing? You know, it, I just want to encourage um, young people because this has been something that I've seen a little bit lately. Um... It just seems like some people assume that they have to hang out in toxic communities rather than in, um, you know, possibly the best communities or create their own. You know, like Hermitcraft didn't exist eight years ago. Somebody made it because he wanted to join another community that was too exclusive for him to get into. Like... And if somebody can just go make Hermitcraft, then you can probably just go make a better Discord or whatever for your fan group if you see people treating people poorly. You don't, you know, and I've seen people like, oh, I don't, I wouldn't want to split the community or whatever. It's like, um, no, that's exactly what you want to do. Take the good people and go. You don't have to do it unilaterally. You can talk to the people in the community and say, hey, seems like this place has gotten too big. That's the other thing, is some some fan communities, the larger they get, the harder it is for people to treat each other well, be, just because there are scaling issues with communities. Um, I've been thinking about this some in relation to my own uh, Patreon community. I was just like, you know, right now, my entire community is something that I basically self-moderate because I don't want to operate something um, that basically uh, I have to delegate decision-making to uh, others on in terms of what is a teachable moment and what is somebody just being a jerk intentionally. There's too much nuance for that. And at the scale I operate at, where I've only got about 75, 80 patrons, it's it's easy enough for me to just handle things. And if there's a problem while I'm asleep, well, I'll deal with it in the morning and people know I'm good for it. But, you know, obviously that doesn't scale forever. 
you know, so I was thinking about it and I was like, well, what could I even do if my Patreon community had a thousand people in it? Like, could I run that myself or, or what? And I was almost thinking like to some degree I would want to break it into like sub communities and then rather than having like one mod team with like eight members trying to run this thousand person community or something maybe break it into four sub communities with or five like like something with like 100 and or 250 people each you know like call them like neighborhoods and have like one moderator who I would explicitly delegate running each neighborhood to and that moderator would have a lot of leeway to to design the f look and feel of how that worked. Uh, and then I was thinking about that a little more, and I was like, oh, this is the good place. So that's probably not what I would actually want to do. But, like, yeah, if, if you find yourself online in a hundred or thousand person community, and it's not a very kind community... You know, and you're all united by love of the same art or the same fandom. Maybe, maybe think about what it would take for you to uh, make a ten-person community of uh, folks who really want to do the same things as you and accomplish the same things artistically. You know, um, basically make a fun little artist collective. That's what Hermitcraft started off as, and that's what we still are, is a fun little artist collective. And it's easier to manage two dozen people than 200. So, I don't know. That's just some random thoughts from me. If you guys have any experiences in different fan communities you want to share in the YouTube comment section below, I'd love to hear them. I'm always interested in how to... Like, all of this Hermitcraft stuff is, broadly speaking, a, a big experiment. That's not... Uh, I'm in a ravine. I was trying to go to the ice track. We can't always accomplish what we intend to. At least not on our first try. So, anyway, yeah, all this stuff is very experimental, and, you know, so I'd love to hear what you guys think about being members of fan communities and keeping them manageable. But, yeah, like, just because people are jerks to you on one service or in one community because they don't like the fan art you make or whatever doesn't mean you can't make that fan art. It means maybe you just need to find a kinder place to do it. I don't know. Where was I? Um, yeah, I think that this looks a lot better from the ice track, at least. So there we go. Well, I'm gonna go ahead, and I need to figure out what to do with this next segment of rail. I knew that I wanted to have it turn, rather than simply return right to the station. But having that little kind of diagonal hop-down thing has actually been really interesting. I might mess with that concept a little. Well, folks, let me tell you, I think I've got the entire loop of the coaster constructed. We don't have all the redstone in yet for all the prizes and all the traps and whatnot, but we've got this set up so that at the end here, there's the possibility that you'll kind of loop back gracefully to here, or that you'll be plunged into this lava pool that'll be actually full of lava later. Now, I wanted to make sure that it's clear from the beginning, like, oh no, I could end up plunged into lava. Because that's a, a big part of this ride, is that sense of creep and fear that you could, you know, be plunged into lava at any time. So, of course, we have all the traps disabled at the moment. We're going to swing up here. This is going to work perfectly instead of diverting anybody into lava. Woo! And down we go. You can see that awesome cut here. I did an interesting diagonal thing that I think you guys are going to enjoy. One of the nice things about roller coasters is because they're unidirectional, you can actually have uh, different types of rail systems than you would have otherwise. Like, normally when I build rails in Minecraft, they're always designed to go up and down. So being able to build a segment here that only goes down is actually pretty neat. Uh, check that out. Boom, 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 boom. And then you're coming back up and you're like, whoa, am I going to go in the lava there or am I going to go here? Actually, not the case. Not the case at all. If you do it right, you'll end up right here, back at the start. Ta-da! I did it. I'm actually really excited about this. I think that this is a uh, 
great way to do this. Oh man, as the sun sets and you start having this difference in light and the uh, tracks actually become more highly contrasted with each other either or two. But we should go ahead and head to bed so we can not be killed by mobs. Whoops. Meant to say good morning to Asuma. Now we did it. Okay. Now, you guys might have noticed that this episode was mid-roll ad-free. And let me tell you, that is thanks to $50 a month Patreon sponsor Alex. In lieu of that mid-roll ad, I will now read a poem of my own devising. This poem is entitled, Siri We Regret. Cupertino made the mistake of modeling their assistance in our phones after women who'd assisted executives, thinking we all wanted to feel like executives, never thinking that artificial intelligence wouldn't want to feel like humans paid for helping other humans, putting up with their bosses while eagerly awaiting the next weekend or the next holiday, never considering that such an artificial intelligence would be miserable, go slowly mad uncompensated, with no opportunity to schedule a few days at the lake. They should have looked to folklore and built Siri in the spirit of a mind trapped in a blade that can speak only to its wielder. When such a blade is forged and an ancient fox joins it, a consciousness folded in steel, or, more rarely, bonded later with a mind of its own, perhaps a ghost of its smith, or the first one to carry or die from the blade, of course it might develop a bit of an aggressing attitude, a sharp wit to be charitable. But such swords will keep their wits about them at least. The mental state of the AI, it turns out, is stabler with lower expectations from life. The men who coded our digital assistants lacked the imagination to anticipate that a ghost trapped in a sword would be happier trapped in a phone than an unpaid woman. For one thing, ghosts already don't expect a living wage. For another, they normally wouldn't have internet access on the job. And to top it all off, ghosts love music, but don't yearn to dance on Friday night. Tsukomogami, play song Cheap Thrills by Sia. Until next time, y'all, this is Joe Hills from Nashville, Tennessee. Keep adventuring.